oftentimes when I'm doing tours of the museum with people, uh, they'll ask me if my dad was a pilot in the military. And the answer is no, he was not. Uh, he was in the 1st Infantry of the U.S. Army, uh, serving in Germany, and uh, only really got involved in aviation when I was still in, I think, middle school. So we're talking the uh, 1960s. We were living in Thermopolis, Wyoming at the time, and uh, he had uh, done work as a maintenance supervisor. Uh, he taught uh, mechanics at a technical college in Thermopolis. It was called Technical College of the Rockies. And from there, he uh, took his mechanical skills up to the Thermopolis airport to work with an organization called Chrysler Flying Service. His friend Mel Chrysler had bought a number of uh, surplus World War II aircraft and he was converting them to do spraying jobs around the United States. Uh, the larger of the aircraft, the Lockheed Constellations, uh, sprayed the entire Gulf of uh, Mexico down in Texas and Mississippi for fire ants uh, and other pests. They did spraying jobs all the way north into Canada. Uh, so they kept those airplanes in tip-top condition uh, and uh, did a lot of work with them during those uh, years during the early 70s. The uh, Lockheed Constellations were a bit of a mystery at the time. They knew that they were surplus aircraft from Tucson, but what they didn't know was that one of the airplanes was uh, General MacArthur's aircraft, the Bataan, and the, uh, one of the other five uh, constellations was uh, President Eisenhower's airplane, uh, and it was called Columbine II. Columbine II was actually the first Air Force One, the first aircraft to have that designation. So uh, my dad had the, the privilege of working on some very historic aircraft. Uh, until a few years ago, we actually had the stainless steel gallery here in this museum from uh, one of those Lockheed Constellations. It's now being reinstalled in Columbine II as we speak in Virginia uh, by an organization called Dynamic Aviation. And we expect to see the original Air Force One uh, with that galley touring the United States again uh, within just a matter of a few years. So I'm very excited and I hope that we can uh, uh, convince the guys at Dynamic Aviation to come back here to Casper where they picked up the galley and let the public come out and enjoy that airplane. Uh, so that kind of touches on a little bit of the, my dad's early involvement with Warbirds. After he had worked for a number of years for Chrysler, uh, a good friend of his who dropped in uh, at the airport there frequently uh, worked for Amico Pipeline Company. And uh, Amico flew pipeline in Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, about five or six state area around Casper, and Casper was their base. Well, this pilot was uh, preparing to go to Chicago to, to fly a different corporate aircraft, and his position was coming open. He recommended my dad for that position, and uh, hence he came here to Casper as a corporate pilot. Uh, he logged many thousands of hours flying surveillance on the pipeline in a 210 Centurion aircraft. Um, I had a lot of fun flying with him back in those years. Got to see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Wyoming and other states from the air from a little different vantage point. During that time that he was working corporately, his hobby uh, was uh, air racing. He hooked up with some guys at the north end of the field here in Casper called Tired Iron Racing Team. And uh, they had uh, a whole stable of World War II aircraft. They had an A-26, a B-25, uh, a F-4U Corsair. They had a P-51, uh, and they had a T-6. And uh, just an amazing assortment of World War II aircraft in, in uh, pristine condition. Dad helped them maintain those aircraft, do engine changes, and, and all of those kind of things. When the aircraft went up for display years later, uh, for a sale, uh, I talked with my dad and, and we decided that he should try to bid on uh, the T-6 that was part of that uh, uh, collection down at Tired Iron. He was successful in that and the T-6 called Wyoming Wildcatter uh, became my dad's personal aircraft and he flew it for many, many years, every year at the National Air Races in Reno. Uh, brought home a lot of trophies to Casper, I uh, even had uh, fan clubs that came to, to Reno every year for uh, just to watch Jim fly. Uh, one of the groups in particular that still comes and visits the museum is from Lander, Wyoming. So uh, 
Air racing became uh, a big passion of his along with building and restoring airplanes. Uh, in addition to his daily job, uh, he would fly 30, 35 hours a week on the pipeline during those years. So uh, I think it's fair to say you have to be very passionate about aviation and the things that he did to spend the amount of hours that he did. Uh, his collection uh, really began back at, at Chrysler Flying Service and, and some of the things here in the museum predate that. Uh, he has a lot of uh, uh, aircraft instruments, navigation instruments from warbirds here at the museum, um, pieces of airplanes, pictures, uh, just a, a wide variety of memorabilia that the public truly enjoys. And uh, the things that he have here of a, has here of a military nature, many of them were donated by friends of his who served uh, in the United States military. Uh, some even are from Russian pilots, uh, Russian items. Uh, it's a very eclectic collection. Uh, but uh, when I talk to veterans that come through the museum, they thoroughly enjoy what they see. They almost always find something here that they connect with personally and uh, enjoy uh, listening to them tell their stories. Uh, so uh, it's a very, very special place for uh, our veterans to visit and especially knowing that we've dedicated it to uh, helping veterans nationwide.